your mouse down to where it says participants. Go to participants. You can see everybody. Yeah, I see Rochelle. Um, yeah. Oh, I see Matthew. Some the med. Hey, I see a whole bunch of folks. No, but can everybody join with their cameras and stuff? We wanted everybody to be on on the Zoom mode. I uh, don't know. Probably a lot of them in their underwear. <laughs> Okay, let's see, we have some more folks coming in here. Oh, I see a familiar name. This is somebody we just onboarded a new client, Dr. Damien, and I don't want to butcher his last name, but I, I recognize that name, Dr. Neville. It's Bloom. <laughs> no, it's, it's, <laughs> I couldn't say his name. I wish, I'm gonna see if, <laughs> I'm gonna ask him. Yeah, I just call him Dr. W at the office for a new client. Okay, there we go, Dr. Saeed. Hey. Okay, so, and then we are broadcasting live on Facebook as well. Um, so for those of you on Facebook, welcome. Everybody here in Zoom, hello. Um, and we just opened up a little earlier. We're just waiting for some folks to trickle in here. Um, in the meantime, this gives us some time to chit chat about the upcoming an awesome roundtable event this month. I got my ticket. I got my hotel. I'm ready. All right. This time, that this is time the when they sleep the, meeting of the year. And this time yeah. when they call everybody to take pictures outside, I'm going to leave my uh, my phone in the food <laughs> or something. Yeah, the venue can't get be beat. And we've got excellent opening entertainment and a great keynote and lots of panels and it's going to be a well our best meeting ever it's the 11th and it's going to be we try to make it better every year i loved it last year i thought it was super super fun i love the group photo and even though i'm not yeah. a Dallas cowboys fan it was pretty awesome to be right there next to the training facility so that was yeah, cool. yeah. the venue is it, it's the best sleep meeting venue <laughs> hands down it's uh, a lot of fun. best venue and the best meeting you know everybody everybody's positive that's you know the first my first round table we were all sitting after the event in the lobby and everybody was having a good time and talking if it's different vendors with each other and if it's different uh camps to call it from doctors that are here and there and everybody was together everybody was everybody was nice to each other everybody was positive and you know I, I would say when you you gotta drag me out of my comfort zone, a weekend at home, enjoying my life to go to a conference. And, and when you go and it's fun, it just, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun. So. Yeah, we kick you out if you're not nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a locker room where you lock them, people that are not nice, put them in timeout <laughs> for like an hour and they can try to come back again. Yeah, we give them another shot. Carrie just put a comment here. She's like, I can't wait for my first round table. She's going to love it. Yep. Here. Okay. Dr. Friedberg's here. Hey. Oh, they'll let anybody in, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> I see Mallory. I see Cade. I see a whole bunch of folks here. All right. Wonderful. And then we have our awesome sleep group solutions, COO Rochelle here as well. Just wanted to give her a little shout out since you all see her there. All right, room filling up. This is pretty cool. All right, so what did you do? What did Rochelle do to join? Because we would like everybody to join. Um, though it's a little bit more fun than just attendees and panelists. Because I think later on, we're actually going to open it for questions and comments. Yeah. So Yeah, we want questions throughout the whole thing. I mean, we can so, start with yeah. you. And 
I'm in the background, guys. Let me just chime in here. If you are an attendee and you want to kind of pop up and, and be able to be heard, just hit the raise your hand and I'll know um, that you, I can like put you up on Zoom with us. So you guys can ask your questions, show your face and whatever you'd like. So everybody just needs to click the raise hand and then we can have them join us. Yeah, so if you don't want to be to be shown, don't click raise your hand. But if you do, then you can click raise hand and then you can talk to us, hang out. But you can raise your hand, join the group, and then just not talk if you don't want to, right? Yes. So why don't everybody raise their hand? It would be nice. Whoever can hear <laughs> me, raise your hand. There's a little button <laughs> over there, raise your hand. Because we're, we're trying something new this time. Dr. Rosenbaum, I was at his office today. He raised his hand. Oh, my. oh Dr. Rosenbaum. So well, now you got to put your cameras on. <laughs> Matthew, Dr. Saeed, Dr. Friedberg. There we go. There we go. There's Dr. Damien. I, I really I want to know how to say his last name. <laughs> I'm like dying. <laughs> All right. Actually, Dr. Rosenbaum, I came yesterday, him and Kathy, and, and they scanned me again for an appliance finally. And, and I'm getting, I think, uh, a Somnomed, a Prosomas, a Pantera. And today I went back to redo my uh, bite for Somnomed. So, Matt, thank you. Perfect. All right, so some um, quick feedback. Oh, Dr. Damien, did you unmute yourself? Please tell me how you say your last name. It looks like he's unmuted. That's fine, no worries. Um, so real quick guys, so I have here right now at 8.04, I wanna say welcome. Thank you for joining us for Sleep TV this evening. Um, we have a very exciting topic today with Dr. Ken Smith uh, this evening. So thank everyone for joining here. Um, I do want to introduce really quick um, my, well, two of my bosses. I wanna introduce our Sleep Group Solutions president, uh, Mr. John Nadeau and also our founder and CEO, uh, Ronnie Ben-David. Um, just to get things started before we start over in our lecture, just to comb over some upcoming things that are here at Sleep Group. John messaged that his camera stopped working, but, um, you know- It I'm, did, it was working right when we started the meeting. And then as soon as it went live, it turned off and like, I, I can't I can't fix it, but I apologize, guys. There we go. So I, I just, you know, I, I want to talk first of all, thank Dr. Smith. You know, I asked him last minute, hey, can can you do a webinar? We're back to sleep TV every Tuesday at 8 p.m. And we tr we want to try to do it a little bit different than all the other webinars that we did or anyone else. We want you guys to be um, live on camera if you can. Um, we're going to have a, a, a small lecture and then basically open questions. If you see all these different forums like Dental Town on Facebook, different places uh, wasted. There's a lot of places and there's a subject and then people are asking questions, but you type it until you get the answer. So really the team, Cindy, Festina um, and John, you know, are, are going to do it on, on Tuesday, 8 p.m. And, and hopefully get as many doctors and team members to join and ask your question. You know, every week something comes up, you don't know, this is the time. It's all in, ask whatever you want. We'll try to help you here. The speaker is gonna try to. And if we don't have an answer, our goal is by next week to get you the answer. So, you know, again, thank you, Dr. Smith. And I just, uh, we posted here the round table. If, if you go to conferences and sleep conferences or any conference, um, in my 25 years in, in dental sleep medicine and sleep, th this is the best conference for me. It, it's a conference with zero ego. Um, you have the best speakers in the industry. And, you know, when there's a break, you can reach out to anyone, ask questions, um, listen to great lectures after hours. Everybody's together. It doesn't matter if you're just a vendor like me 
or if you're Dr. Ken Smith, we're all together over there learning and, and it's just fun. And I said it before, before you guys, it, you know, to get me on a weekend, to not be at home with my family and go to a conference, it has to be a really good conference. And this is, this is the conference that me and the whole SGS team, we just wait for it. We, we wait to go for that. There's argument, if somebody can't go, can I go? So really, th this is the event to go to. So Dr. Smith, I appreciate it. And looking forward to seeing you in uh, two weeks, three, two and a half weeks. Yeah, it's coming up. Thanks, Ronnie. Appreciate that. Here's Dr. Smith. There we go. So for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to move forward with um, our uh, tonight's topic with Dr. Ken Smith. Again, Dr. Ken Smith, thank you so much. I'm kicking off Sleep TV again with you as the starter is very, very, it's an honor. I always joke to other clients of ours, I kind of call you like, you know, kind of like, you know, Jedi master of sleep medicine. And as a Star Wars fan, it's a huge <laughs> honor I bestow on you. So um, again, I don't want anyone to be shy this evening. If you have questions, type it up in the Q&A. We're also on Facebook. We will be monitoring those questions as well. Um, and throughout the um, uh, lecture, I mean, the webinar tonight, if you have a question, just ask for it and then we'll just chime in and we'll make this a discussion here this evening. So Dr. Smith, it is all yours. All right. Well, let me see if I can find my presentation here. Uh, let's see. I have too many screens open. Uh, hmm. I know it's here somewhere. Uh, to allow me, I'm going to shut down a bunch of stuff first, and that way I won't get too confused here. Um, well, I did want to mention, you know, people may, those that don't know me may not know kind of what I'm all about, but uh, we've got, uh, this should probably tell you all you need to know. I have now 90 employees on my sleep team and all we do is sleep. We have sleep physicians, we have nurse practitioners, PAs, psychologists. So you might imagine I've got a lot of stuff going on and we treat a lot of patients. So anything you hear me say, um, I've been doing this for 27 years and it's not like uh, you can have a practice with 90 employees tomorrow, but I've seen everything. And certainly I'm, I love to be able to answer questions for anybody that has anything that it, whether you're starting out or whether you've got uh, a great practice going on, you just want to be better. Uh, I doubt anybody here wants to plateau. I don't think that's where you are. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to do that. Uh, hopefully, uh, all of you want to improve your practices. Uh, you know, if you don't want to improve your practice, you probably don't need to be on this um, on this presentation right now. So. Um, all right, so let me try this again. Well, it is usually not this hard. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right. Can everybody see this? Yep. And you, you're good? Yep. Okay. All right. So what we wanted to talk about, at least for a little bit, was the ability to treat severe patients with appliances. And I think we get scared off a little bit by those patients that are severe. And we think, well, those aren't for us. And, and largely that's because our sleep physician friends typically tell us that they don't work on severe patients. Um, that is not true. Uh, but it's because they just haven't seen enough experiences, uh, enough people with severe apnea being treated by appliances. So it's really up to you to treat these patients and to then show the results to your referring partners, uh, to your team, so they're aware of it. Um, now, of course, it is less predictable. And when I get a patient that asked me, uh, let's say their AHI is 40, 
And by the way, I hate AHI, but it is what it is right now with insurance companies. So that's that's what we use. Uh, AHI is 40 and your patient says, will this work? What, you know, should I get CPAP or should I get an appliance? And I'll tell them that CPAP is more predictable to get you treated effectively. Uh, we can treat you with an appliance. It's not as predictable, but certainly it is a lot easier to wear. And think about it for the rest of your life. What would you rather do? Would you rather wear something in your mouth for the rest of your life or a machine where you're tied to the side of the bed for the rest of your life? And if you go straight to a machine, then you'll never know if an oral appliance would have worked or not. So that's kind of the conversation I like to have with patients. Now, obviously, with some insurances, they require you to try a CPAP first. And if that's the case, we'll do that. So these are some situations where you might be able to use a PAP. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, use an appliance. Obviously, if you've got a patient that's intolerant, uh, don't just give up and say, well, they're intolerant to PAP. There's no way an appliance will work. Even if it doesn't work on a severe patient and getting their HI below five, at least you're going to make them better. So please don't be scared away from treating these severe patients. Sometimes they just want to have a combination treatment. You know, whether they wear a PAP at home and travel with their appliance, a lot of your patients are traveling. Uh, they can use an appliance when they travel. And sometimes we combine it with Inspire. Uh, we get we have some ENT friends here in the Dallas Fort Worth area that we will, um, you know, they'll we'll send patients to them. They send patients to us. It's being nice with our referral sources, and uh, I would encourage you to become partners with some Inspire people in your area, because if they know that you have that as an option, that you might send patients to them who are either um, appliance intolerant. Uh, you know, they don't have enough teeth or, and they're, and they're PAP intolerant, you know, that might be the next best option for you. So, you know, travel with PAP, with Inspire, and then there are conditions that you need to consider when you're looking at the severe patient. Uh, some severe patients, I'm pretty confident we can treat, and some severe patients, I'm not so confident. One thing we look at is the mean SpO2. And this is something I don't think gets talked about enough. The mean SpO2, you can see this on most studies, I think is more important uh, than the nadir for sure. I don't put a lot of confidence in the nadir, which is the lowest oxygen. I don't mean to dumb this down, but not everybody knows all these terms. So I'll, I'll do my best to kind of walk the line here and make sure that you understand the things that I'm referring to. The mean SpO2 is the average oxygen during the entire night of sleep. And if this drops below 90, uh, that's somebody that you're going to struggle to treat. If it stays above 90, you got a better shot at it. If their T90 is greater than about 10% of the night, it's gonna be more of a struggle to treat. Uh, if their BMI is elevated, and this comes from research, we know that if they've got a high BMI, there's less chance of treating them effectively because there's a lot more going on with them. And then you also look at the mobility of the mandible. If they can only protrude three millimeters, if they've got restrictions for some reason, which is the minority of patients, but if they, if they can't do that, uh, obviously, if they have a severe gag reflex, uh, just today we had two patients that were struggling because of a gag reflex, and we have ways of controlling that and helping them through it, which we won't get into right now, but these are all situations you need to consider when you're deciding between an appliance and, and PAP therapy. Now, we don't really advertise that we use appliance as first therapy as, for, as the first treatment option for patients with severe, uh, but if the patient chooses it after they know everything that we've discussed with them, then we do go that way because I know that we can help them. Now, I'm going to show you a few situations. Um, there's this, okay, here's a, 
I've got before and after studies. Sorry, are there any questions? I don't, I don't want to rush through anything here if there's questions already. I just want to mention really quick. So I don't know if you're, uh, have you started the slides yet? Oh, great. Yeah, it's supposed to. Yeah, bless her. I just thought you were just, I just love hearing you talk, but I just want to make sure. There we go. Okay, so now we can see the slides. There we go. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Sorry. No worries. Okay, I had a lot of naked girls on the previous slides. Do you do I need to go back? <laughs> Behave, Dr. Smith. Proceed. Okay. <laughs> okay. So these this is a for those unfamiliar with a watch pad, this is a watch pad before and after study. Uh, I didn't highlight the numbers, but there's uh, these are I, we do everything at four percent, by the way, uh, these days. Um, any studies that you do should be scored at 4% because insurance companies demand that. The only exception is United Healthcare right now. I know this isn't an insurance talk, but that's why you're going to see these studies at 4%. Uh, this is even a BMI of 42. So I just said that it's not as likely to treat an obese patient, but here we've got a BMI of 42. The AHI went from 71.2. I know it's hard for you to see these numbers. A 71.2 down to, shoot, I can't even see it, 6.7. So that's a significant increase. What, we keep an Excel spreadsheet of all of our success cases in case anybody ever wants some examples. So it was really easy for me to pull these up and put them on slides. Uh, there, I've got a lot of them. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to show you a few just because, you know, I could even be lying here and showing you two different patients. You don't know for sure, but there's no reason for me to do that. This is reality. Uh, here's another obese patient, 32.9. Now, sometimes we get patients that come in with studies. That's why we see a different study on the left than you see on the right. But the AHI was 36.9 on the left, and we got it down to 0.5. Again, these work on severe patients. 59-year-old male, uh, HI went from 37.8 down to 2.6. Uh, so these are just three examples I wanted to show you. But I did want to tell you one story, too. Uh, this is a patient that we saw uh, in April, my assistant that was with me about 12 years ago when I saw this patient. She is on this. I think she's on this, and she'll recognize. I'm just going to call her Susan, not her real name. Uh, she came in and her AHI was 92.5. So at the time she came in to see us, all she could do was walk about 10 feet before she had to sit down. Very unhealthy, um, just in really, really bad shape. But she was PAP intolerant. She couldn't do it. And so we said, well, what the heck? Let's see what we can do. Uh, we put her in an appliance and then started following up. Amazingly, when she realized that she was doing something for herself, she started wearing an appliance. She said, well, I'm doing this for myself. I'm going to do my best to start walking. She started walking, watching what she ate. And in 18 months, this is her. So she's lost some weight, but her HI is now down to 5.1. Her auction is at 91 minimum. Now, what you don't know at this point is that she was also using oxygen, two liters a minute, uh, just at night when she slept. So she had a cannula of oxygen in her nose, and she was very nervous about not using it. She had been surviving with that cannula, at least she thought she was. So she kept using the appliance and the cannula, and I didn't have anything against that. That's fine. If you can keep yourself oxygenated with your mandible postured forward, that's a good treatment for patients that do have a problem with oxygen. So then another 18 months go by, and this is her. She has finally lost enough weight that she's confident enough that she's willing to try it without oxygen. So I told her, I said, listen, just go for the first half of the night without oxygen, and then you can set an alarm and you can put oxygen in, and we can compare and see how you do. Well, if you, you take a look at this, you can see that the oxygen stayed above 90% all night long. She did not have to put in the, the oxygen cannula. But at this point, uh, her AHI got down to 0.7. So we went from 92 to 0.7, but it was accompanied by weight loss. 
You all know that weight gain increases apnea, weight loss can improve it. There's many studies to show that. So we, in our office, we also have a nurse practitioner who has had seven years in a weight loss clinic, and she works with all of our patients on weight loss now, um, prescribes medicines, gives them injections, um, and this brings in patients who then, you know, we have to, we make sure that they have a sleep study before they can go through the weight loss treatments because they need to have their apnea treated, which will then help them lose the weight. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. It's like, do you notice that once you get their apnea under control, they're motivated and responsive to it, and it actually helps them get going on that journey? And yeah, I can, yeah. I can anecdotally say that. Um, research doesn't really say that. It says some t- <laughs> the average patient on right. CPAP actually gains a little weight. So it's it's not fun to see research like that. But certainly if you're properly motivating your patients and if you have methods to help them lose weight, that's going to help. So after, you know, three years, 170 pounds lost and AHI going from 92 down to 0.7 with the help of an oral appliance, I uh, haven't seen her in a while. I know she came back in uh, not a few years ago anyway, and uh, she's she's still alive. And of course, she's doing much better than she was prior to treatment. Uh, well, then I've just got the roundtable slide, the things that, that you've already talked about. Uh, I know that we had some other things we wanted to discuss. But first, let's see what kind of questions we have about treating the severe patient. All right, guys, is there anybody who has any questions, please feel free to type in the question and answer. We have also enabled our chat feature here. Um, So feel free to do that as well. Let's take a peek here, here we go. So I have a question um, from Dr. Rosenbaum. So if the patient has a high BMI and O2 parameters are not so great and are CPAP intolerant, have you still gotten success and move forward? Well, I'll still make them an appliance. I think that's the next best therapy to use before surgery. So what we'll tell them is it's unlikely we can get you effectively treated, but let's do our best. Let's get you an appliance. And then if we'll we'll, we'll maximize the effectiveness of it. And then once we get to that point, we will then discuss other options, whether it's Excite OSA, whether it's positional training, whether it's some kind of surgery. weight loss techniques, whatever we need to do, we would love. See, this is why I am where I am right now, because years ago, when I was just doing appliances, I didn't have anything else in our arsenal. I was so bothered by the patients that we couldn't treat, um, that, that we couldn't fix. But about three years ago is when I started adding CPAPs. So in, in my office, we sell APAPs, we sell bi-level PAPs, uh, as well as, of course, appliances and, and Excite OSA. And um, we, the only thing we don't do right now is surgery. Uh, my daughter is in her last year of an oral surgery residency, so I'm going to try to convince her. <laughs> so maybe we'll do surgery <laughs> at some point. Yeah. She's moving to the Dallas area, but she's not that wild on treating airway yet. So I need to get her excited about this. Perfect. So I have another question here, um, which I'm going to call him Dr. Damien, because I, again, um, so sorry, sir. I'm going to call you tomorrow and find out how I say your last name. Um, He's asking, is there a specific oral appliance therapy you prefer over others for people who have severe sleep apnea? No, not really a specific appliance for severe. I'll try any appliance for severe. Um, There are some that, I mean, in a way, if you think about it, limiting uh, the crowding of the tongue. So if you've got an appliance that gives the tongue more room, if their tongue is large, I may consider a specific type of appliance. Uh, And sometimes, unfortunately, the insurance dictates what kind of appliance I'm making. So if you're just doing cash, you can always choose whatever appliance you want. Um, but, but unfortunately, you know, we, we are a large insurance-based practice. 
Uh, we maximize insurance benefits and we want to make sure that it's covered. So that does force our hands on the style of appliance that we use. But um, no, in, in general, um, maybe don't crowd the tongue. Other than that, uh, you just got to move the jaw forward and hold it there. And it's got the have the ability to, to keep going. Now, if I one other thing to consider would be using an appliance that can go forward in 0.1 millimeter adjustments because you can dial them in a little bit better. The appliances that jump 0.5 or one millimeter might be too much of a jump once they get out there at you know six or seven millimeters. Uh, they can't go to the next uh, setting. So if they can go 0.1, once a month or something, they can keep going. So that might be another thing that I consider in that severe patient. Wonderful. And by the way, I have learned it is Dr. Wychowski. He finally spelled it out for me. So I, could send it. Oh, I think that's how I would have said it. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Let me take a peek. Um, here we go. So I have one here. So um, I have Carrie asking, so you'll still make an appliance on someone with, um, let me see, on O2 levels below 90. She's asking, oh, yeah. okay, if you see improvement in their collapse test on the pharyngometer, will you make an appliance for those under 90? Um, that's her question. I will still do that. Yes. Okay. I don't let the negative tests tell me not to treat. If they're PAP intolerant, now keep in mind, if they're PAP intolerant, it's I treat one way. And if they're not PAP intolerant, that's one reason why we carry APAPs and, and bi-level PAPs in our office, because we want to have that option for patients. John, I don't know if you remember the story, but I don't know if it was maybe 2007 or eight. Um, we, we went to Dr. Salama when they started Dental XP. And, and, I remember, yeah. And we trained and we trained the office, but it was really to do a video with Dr. Salama. And the photographer, the videographer, was really a big guy. And, and he did a sleep test before, and he was over 100 AHI. And we said, well, we'll just do you an appliance just because we need somebody for the video. That, that was it. And actually, I don't remember how much his, his AHI went down, but it was, we could not believe it. It was I, and I, I'm just throwing a number, but it was probably under 20 because we were all shocked. And this is like 2008. And it was just like, we, we told him it's probably not going to work, but let, let's try it. So that, that was an interesting one. That case actually brought up another story too, like something that I, I use in teaching a lot and, and talking about uh, letting tissue heal and, and follow-up time because in that one specifically, I remember we delivered the device. We tested him with an HST that day. So we put the appliance in his mouth and he got a sleep study that night, which was a time thing. It wasn't normally the way you would do that. <laughs> um, and it, it was dramatically better, but it, it wasn't a home run. It was just better. Um, and I remember going back there a few months later, having he, he hadn't touched the device. He hadn't, he'd worn it every night but he hadn't adjusted it, hadn't moved, hadn't done anything. And we, we followed up and tested him again, probably two months after that, uh, of wearing the device every night. And it was much, much better still, even from where, where it was on the first day. And, you know, Ken, I'm sure this is something you see a lot too. And, and kind of like the give the story being give the tissue time to heal and give the airway time to heal and you'll, you'll get some progressive improvement even without messing with position. Yeah, it's amazing. We'll have a, another thing that <laughs> there's always the just contrast. We, if, if we start somebody in HI of 90 and we get them to 30, they're feeling amazing. And you're going, yeah. how, can you, how can you be feeling amazing when you have severe <laughs> apnea, right? You're still really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's such a difference in how they felt before Right. That, you know, it's just it's your, it's it's where you are in life. And, and you know, apnea doesn't just happen overnight. It's a very gradual thing. And so you just get worse and worse and worse over time. And it's like the frog in boiling water. Before you know it, you've got severe apnea and go, oh, my gosh, what do I do?
Let's mute it. I'm I have seeing more uh, I'm yeah. seeing more questions. Yeah. So Doctor, yeah. So Dr. Rubin asked, which appliance do you make the most frequently, Dr. Smith? You know, I'm kind of appliance agnostic. I just want to treat the patient the best way I can. And I make four or five different ones. Um, if you want to contact me privately, I could eat, I could give you the percentages of different appliances I make, but I don't really have a specific favorite appliance that I make for anybody. It just depends on the patient and it depends on their experiences. Many of my patients have had appliances before. They come in, they want the exact same appliance. Um, the interior of appliances vary. The ability to keep uh, appliances clean, some stain more than others. We'll go through that with the patient and let the patient help us decide which appliance to make for them. Because if the patient chooses the appliance, they're more likely to wear it. If you tell them this is the one you should use, they're less likely to wear it because you made the decision and the patient themselves didn't make the decision. Interesting, thank you. I have Dr. Files here um, asking, she's saying, good evening. I was curious if you are recommending the Remplenish oropharyngeal strengthening straws with many or any of your patients with sleep disordered breathing. I am not because I've never heard of that. Me neither. Dr. Files, <laughs> I got to get more info on that. That's, I'm curious. Then you think that yeah. jumps up on my Instagram always that you buy in different, uh, different workout and breathing and stuff? I that that might be one of the ones that we have to look into and answer the question next week. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure it out. Um, um, I see another question on, um, well, a couple actually, uh, one on kind of co-nasal treatment. So if you if you have nasal obstruction, nasal resistance, if you do a rhinometer and you get a really bad result, mm -hmm. what are you doing in combination therapy for nasal airway with your appliances? Yeah. So, I mean, the Oasis is, is an appliance that helps the nasal airway some. We use that sometimes. But as far as uh, the, uh, the mutes out there and yep. all of the different techniques for, uh, you know, either internally or externally, read the right strips. There are techniques for doing that, but that's why we like to refer to our ENT friends too, because we know that the primary reason for an appliance not working is a lack of the ability to breathe through their nose properly. So we want them to breathe through their nose if at all possible. And we're working with our ENTs to make that happen. Uh, but sometimes they just they just don't want to do that. So we'll have them wearing mutes or breather out strips or combination or, you know, I don't I'm not a big believer in using nasal sprays for that uh, other than for diagnostic purposes. OK, let me see here. I have another question here. Can CPAP and appliance be worn alternately if there's a case where they need CPAP but don't like to wear it all the time, like if they travel a lot? That's a pretty regular thing we do in our office. And I also tell them that if you alternate between two different treatments, you're likely to uh, improve the, uh, or I guess, decrease the likelihood of side effects. So, um, you know, if you've been treating this long enough, you know, you'll get some bite changes with some patients. But if you wear an appliance when you travel and then, and then go back to CPAP when you're at home, then there's very little chance that you're gonna get a bite change. Let's see here, I have, which appliance do you recommend for denture or partial um, patient? Okay, for dentures, for example, and we, we gosh, we have a lot of these too. Uh, what we'll do is create, what I, we use a number six round burr and I will make a dimple <clears throat> in the denture, in the uh, interproximal between the molars and the premolars in all four quadrants, and then scan the denture so that the appliance then locks into those dimples. Uh, the only problem with dentures is then the retrusive forces on the maxilla can cause some new sore spots. We typically see them in the canine areas. So I'll always take a patient and I'll, I'll push back on the upper denture and I'll say, now you don't have any sore spots now, but when I push back on this, you can, you can feel those pressure points. You may develop some sore spots. 
these are almost always Medicare patients. So in Medicare in our office usually doesn't cost much. The Advantage plans cost a little bit. So I tell them, you know, it's about 50-50 whether this is going to work or not. But it's worth a try because you can't wear your pap. You've tried. This is, this is the next best thing. So we will try. And, and I usually use a herpes style appliance in those patients. You could probably use anything, but I've been using the herpes so long in those situations that that's what I'll go with. Okay. Um, I have another question here. Um, newbie to sleep here. Um, and going by rhinometry readings, what nasal treatment in combination with appliances might you use? Oh, I read that one. We did that one. Oh, you did that one? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and okay, Dr. Wachowski again. Um, um, if you are aware of any studies out there that research the nasal O2 cannula in conjunction with oral appliance therapy, and he's wondering if it's a common treatment modality, such as someone who's CPAP intolerant, um, if many sleep doctors consider the oral appliance and cannula treatment that you have kind of mentioned. Yeah, unfortunately, I've struggled with sleep physicians in the past with this. They just don't like that. Uh, they don't like using nasal cannulas at all with apneic patients, which has always bothered me. And I understand if somebody thinks the nasal cannula is going to open their airway, well, it's not going to do that. The oxygen can't get to where it right. needs to go. So I think it's a fantastic therapy, but getting physicians to understand it and agree with it is a struggle. So I can't say that it's very common out there. Um, and it's not even that common in my office because we can't get enough physicians to agree to prescribe it. I can't prescribe oxygen for a patient. It needs to be a physician. Okay. See here. And um, I have someone asking if you um, wouldn't mind sharing your protocol or guidelines on starting position for an oral appliance and how often and how much do you titrate at a time? Yeah. And it, how, how much we titrate is going to depend on the style of appliance. But as far as starting, yeah, I use pharyngometry to get that starting position. Uh, and if we find that, say, two millimeters past edge to edge is the most effective treatment, I'm not going to start them there anyway. We just know that's our target. So we'll start them back. Uh, and it also depends on their diagnosis. So if they're mild, uh, I might even, and in fact, I usually will start them without any protrusion at all. I just get the best vertical with the pharyngometer, and then I'll start them with no protrusion because you never know that just holding the mandible there uh, might fix them. And honestly, that's what pa when patients are most concerned and they start, they've been on the internet, they've read that this can change bites, and I'm really worried, mm -hmm. I'm scared, and my dentist told me not to get one of these things <laughs> because it's going to change my bite. I tell them, you know what, your HI is just nine. We're just going to keep you, we're going to start you at the starting position at where you, without any movement forward, there's no way your bike can change that way. And then it's up to you to decide if you move further forward. And as far as how much you titrate, uh, if it's a, a whole half meet, millimeter uh, or a full millimeter, we'll have them, uh, yeah, sorry, a half or a full millimeter, we'll have them do it once a week. Uh, if it's 0.1 millimeter, I usually have them do, do a, a 0.1 turn every night. And we're looking to improve their chief complaint. Uh, always, always, always find out their chief complaint. We call it the M&M, &M, what matters most to the patient, what got them in the office. So if what matters most to them is making their bed partner happy, then they're going to adjust until the bed partner's happy. If what matters most is their sleepiness and fatigue, then they're going to keep adjusting until that happens. However, we don't want them to adjust it too far because their fatigue and sleepiness could be due to something else. So we will uh, insist on a follow-up study to make sure that the, it's still apnea that they're trying to treat because the apnea could be treated, but they could still be fatigued and sleepy. So you don't want to over-titrate, but obviously you want to get to, to, to wherever you need to be, that target position, that causes the least problems for the patient and effectively treats their chief complaint. And you touched on a point there. I see it's like one of my biggest pet peeves with this is like the over titration. And I, I'm sure you've seen hundreds, thousands of cases now that have come in because I see them and, and you see way more than me. Uh, but I'm sure you've seen a lot of patients come in who 
were, you know, were given a tap appliance by their own general dentist 10 years ago, and we're told to crank this screw and they've advanced 12 millimeters and they have all this side effect and all this pain, and it's actually not helping them. I mean, how often do you see that where patients are just so out of the ballpark of where they need to be and because well, they were told to crank this magical screw and it will fix you? What frustrates me and what I have learned over the years since my own patients even do that, and my team knows not to tell patients to just keep adjusting, right. but they will come back in at their three-month adjustment, and they'll be adjusted all the way out, and I'll say, why did you keep going? Well, that's what I thought I was supposed to do. They said just, <laughs> no, yeah. we don't say that, right? So sometimes they just hear what they want to hear. And, and, and so I can't really say that another office told them to do this because my own patients do the same thing and we don't tell them that. It's true. Now, do you, do you let everybody titrate or are there people that you, you kind of, you keep the wrench in, in the office, you don't give it to them? Well, if we had enough, enough personnel, <laughs> enough chairs, and <laughs> yeah, we might get them all to come back in and adjust. And certainly yeah. if you're just treating, you know, five or 10 patients a month, you know, you can probably do that. Um, we prefer the patient to, to titrate themselves. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously there are some Medicare patients that struggle and they just want to sure. come in and have a party in our office and stay, hey, stay around for a couple of hours talking and so yeah, we we'll see them. We'll adjust it for them. I have a um another question. We have a few. You're, you're quite popular, sir. Um, I have a private message uh question here. So I have someone asking for advice in regards to um what would you do if you get a sleep study, you treat them with an oral appliance, getting your bite with the pharyngometer, and somehow the follow up sleep study, the AHI number is higher. Oh, that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's an entire webinar right there yeah it is yeah it can happen right so there's some things you need to look at well first of all i want to make the point that if their original study is single digit ahi i don't do follow-up studies there's too much night to night variability and that patient could be doing great their partner's loving them they're feeling great they don't fall asleep at stoplights anymore you do a follow-up study and the AHI was nine and now it's 11, right? Then all of a sudden in their mind, oh, this isn't working. working. I thought it was. <laughs> so please be careful. Now, my sleep physician friends don't like that philosophy. They want to get it below five and they want to do follow-up studies on these single digit patients, but I never encourage it. In fact, I even gripe at my assistants that give a patient a follow-up study if the original HI was in single digits because there's too much chance of it going up or not improving much at all. So I forgot the question now. So like, so uh, oh, if the HI goes up. Goes yeah. higher, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I would also look at the oxygen. You look at the, remember I talked about the mean oxygen number. Look at what that is. Because if you think about this, if you have an apneic event that's a minute long, or you have two apneic events that are both 10 seconds long, mm -hmm. you're going to look twice as bad, even though you have two 10 second events. And personally, I'd rather have two second, 10 second events than a full minute event. And I talk to patients about this all the time because they're wanting to know, and I'm, I'm showing them, listen, your oxygen didn't dip below 88% all night long. If your events were 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it would be dropping below that. So I'm feeling really good about your oxygen here. And I know that your events are pretty short. Uh, the problem is, yeah, that number can go up even though they're better. So look at the oxygen and, and really don't treat, I learned this many years ago, don't treat the polysomnogram treat the patient. And if the patient is doing better, they're loving life, they're glad they're getting treated, that's one thing. If they're still not feeling good and the apneic events went up and their oxygen is no better, that happens too. If that happens, an appliance is not going to be for them. 
And we will just, you know, we never guarantee treatment. And I hope none of you do that. We never promise this is going to fix them. We can feel confident. We can say, you know what? I think this is the best treatment for you right now, uh, but it's healthcare. We can't make any promises in healthcare. And they all understand that. You just got to tell them that. So if you don't create any positive, now, yes, well, patients will hear what they want to hear. And sometimes they'll come back and say, you told me this would fix my apnea. We never say that. Mm -hmm. But somehow they get that. So sometimes you just have to punt. I mean, it's this is healthcare. You cannot fix everybody. But look at their symptoms first. And then you can look at the numbers and look at that oxygen and see what happened with that. And you might be surprised the oxygen's better. Thank you. A um, couple of more um, questions here I have. Are the typical M&Ms for severe patients different from the typical M&Ms for mild or moderate? You know, it depends on sex. The female patient who is mild will be more fatigued than the male patient who is severe. So you just, it always depends on that. So I can't really say that there's that much of a a difference in severe and mild and moderate uh, symptoms that they come with. We, And those of you that have been treating this long, you know you've got very severe patients that are only here because their bed partner is insisting that they come. They feel great. They got no problems. And then you've got those mild patients that come in and they're typically female. I, I hate to be sexist, but that even the research says this. They'll come in with an AHI of seven and they're just fatigued. They're, they they struggle through the day. You can still help those patients, but it's all over the board. I can't say that I see different symptoms with mild, moderate, and severe because everybody's different. Okay. I have uh, what patient criteria helps you determine or lean towards a certain type of appliance, for example, dorsal fin versus hinge versus EMA. Right. I mean, I've heard lecturers that say the hinged appliances create fewer TMD problems. I have not noticed that. Um, I'm not sure where that, I, I, in fact, I don't think it's research. Um, I, it, I think it's all anecdotal. And I get some patients, you know, what, what one thing that I wanted to say that many people may not be aware of is that if you have somebody that they've been wearing an appliance for a while and they develop unilateral TMJ pain, uh, they've got muscle pain on one side or joint pain, either one. I will adjust the other side further forward, uh, somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3, maybe 0.4 millimeters, uh, if you've got the type of appliance that can do that. If you've got the 0.1 millimeter herbs type appliances, then you can do that. If you've got the kinds with fins, um, some fins have 0.1 millimeter adjustments, some fins don't. So you really need to, to sometimes you're going to make the decision if somebody has had previous TMD problems, I'm usually going to start them out with a herpes type anyway, just because if they've had TMD in the past, they're more likely to have it with an appliance. So I'm going to want the ability to adjust differently on one side than the other. So that would be one determinant in what, what kind of appliance I want to do. I'm a big fan of the thin appliances, though. Those are typically my favorites. Um, but I, so that would, I would say that's my default. But if I'm a little worried with the more severe patient or the prior TMD patient, I will try to stay with the herp style or the, I should say the jack screw style. It doesn't have to be a herps, but you need to be able to adjust in 0.1 millimeter increments. Okay. And I have two more questions here. I have someone asking how often do you see your patients for follow-up or adjustment? We see them, this has changed over the years, and I would say you shouldn't really follow what I do in my practice just because we have a different kind of a practice. Right now, we're seeing them at a month and then three months, then six months, and then yearly after that. But if you're just starting out, uh, you're not doing that much, I would encourage you to see them at a week um, and then maybe a month, maybe see them a little sooner on that first visit. We tell every patient that, you know, we're going to schedule you a month out, but it is vital that you let us know if you're struggling at all with anything and you let us know and we'll see you before that. But for now, we want to give you some time to adjust to just wearing this and then start adjusting it. 
And then we'll assess it in one month. And then at that point, we'll decide, do we need to do a follow-up study or do we need to, do, to wait until that three-month visit where we will then do a follow-up study? We try to always, always do a follow-up study at the three-month point if we haven't done one before that. Okay. Um, I have someone asking, uh, well, like you said, I have two patients have titrated to vertical four millimeters and six millimeters. They're doing quite well. When do you need to adjust and at what time interval we need to check again? And I think you kind of touched base with this in terms of follow-up. Um, yeah. They're also asking if um, they if they should do, um, the they have a watch pad here with the appliance just to see the report in that sense. Yeah, I'll uh, and and I, actually, what we'll do if we have somebody who desaturates their T ninety, which means the percent of time they spend under ninety percent, if that is two percent or higher, we will give them a well U ring. You can use any pulse oximeter. That's just the one that we use, and that well U ring they use uh, because we can bill for it as well. We can bill insurances, and they insurance pays pretty well on that. So we just give that to them, and they can do it as many times as they want. And then they send us pictures of their oximetry readings. Um, and then that sort of guides them as to, as to whether they need to do some more adjustments. If they're really concerned about oxygen uh, and after they see their study, sometimes they're concerned about their oxygen. So we will do the well you rings. And then once we get enough reports and we see that they're in pretty good shape with oxygen, we will then do a follow-up study with the watch pad or Medibot or apnea link, or we've got quite a few different kinds. But watch pets are favorite. Okay. And I have someone, I got a late question here. What are the key things that motivate physicians to refer patients to your practice? Uh, number one, it's it's being a diplomat. No, 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 that's not it at all. <laughs> they don't care. Okay, guys. I mean, uh, you're. I think it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to get your diplomat. So I'm not saying not to do that. But honestly, I think number one is, is treating the patient right. It's their patient that they're sending you. And if you don't treat them well and they don't provide a good review and they don't say nice things about you, they're not going to send you more patients. So part of that is minimizing the cost to the patient. If you end up charging them $3,500 cash for every patient, um, they're not going to keep sending you patients. Uh, unless you're just an excellent salesman and you know these physicians well and they understand that it, their patients should all pay $3,500. Most physicians do not think that way. So minimize the cost, treat your patients extremely well, and then communicate with your patients too. I mean, with your physicians. We send a letter to every referral source every time we schedule them. And then when we, and now it depends on the some physicians say, don't send me anything else. I've gotten enough letters from you. I don't need anything else. <laughs> so, but yeah. Um, so we will send, you know, until they tell us to stop, we will send them information about how we're treating their patient. That's good. And I have, um, I have an interesting one here. How often do you utilize CBCT with your severe patients or any severity actually? And if so, when do you choose to have one? You know, that's something I, I would not go out and buy a CBCT just for sleep. Uh, I wouldn't do it. Um, it's a huge expense. Uh, insurance, they do pay. It's, uh, it's a little unpredictable. Um, but gosh, it's if you're if you're going to be doing implants and other things and you're going to utilize a CBCT for that, then of course, do a CBCT of the airway. You need a 15-15 view to be able to see the airway. But, um, and, 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 you know, you can look for nasal abnormalities, uh, you can look for cysts and different things, but I would encourage you if you do a CBCT to have it read because you're liable for that if you don't have it read. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you, get a CBCT if you're going to treat sleep. I can't do that. Yeah. And well, I'm going to squeeze in this last one here. Um, and guys, I'm really happy everyone had questions. This is a really great discussion. Do you require a recent dental checkup prior to making an appliance? I don't. Nope. Because they're coming in for a specific reason. And if I stop them, it's why I don't like any kind of therapy that takes two years to treat. When they come in, they want to get treated yesterday. 
I mean, they're, they're in a hurry to get fixed or they wouldn't show up. So no, I don't insist on that. I will encourage it. Yeah. I mean, I'll say, you know, you've got some gum disease here. You've got some loose teeth or whatever, but it would freak you out if I showed you some of the dentitions I put appliances in. It's <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> you know, but they're sick. They need to get treatment. You know, I right. was at Dr. Rosenbaum's office yesterday and I still have some dental work, but I said, I, I need my appliance, you know, I'll get an appliance and, and we'll fix the teeth later. So I, I think you want to get treated. So yeah, yeah this good. comes up a lot, a lot. I, in fact, a yeah. uh, pr- couple of times, so, even Cindy, today, it came up. Cindy, Somebody's can I getting... do some self-promotion? What's uh, that? <laughs> I said, I'm asking <laughs> approval from Cindy, but, you know, I, I, I just want to, you know, Stop for two seconds and you know, oh, say it sure. again. We're, we're looking to see everybody at Roundtable. Come and ask the SGS team about AppSME, a whole management concept yeah. of, of um, dental clinics that do sleep. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Smith is doing a, a few hundred appliances a month, and we would love to talk to you guys about it. Um, a little bit about the VA and national contracts and a little bit of about in-network wood insurance companies. Um, That's going to be do, a big. You know, yeah, I do. Sorry. I do want to thank. You know, we're trying to bring all the vendors together. So, you know, I appreciate Matt from Somnomid joining us. I appreciate Len from Prosomnus joining us. I think we we want to have all the providers that help dentists around the country in dental sleep medicine jo- join this Sleep TV. And next time, if you guys have anything you want to share, please do. You know, because it, it is important. We want to save more patients' lives and get more dentists involved. So appreciate you guys taking the time and joining us. So sorry to bother you, Dr. Smith, but you know, just <laughs> gotta thank everybody and 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 the team. You know, Fastina that's hiding behind, but she she's the one that, you know, in 24 hours got over 50 people for this Zoom. Cindy, Rochelle, and John, appreciate you guys a lot. And keep on with the questions. Um, and just, I just want to throw out there. So I know that um, through Facebook, which by the way, Dr. Suarez was saying hi, Rebecca Leahy was saying hi, they're all on Facebook. Um, I want to make sure that you guys, um, clients, for those of you that are existing SGS clients, if there's any other topics that you'd like to um, see in a webinar and so forth, please reach out to me. Um, most of you guys have my connect on uh, Facebook, or you could contact me over at the Sleep Group Solutions Call Center. Um, because every Tuesday, uh, we're going to be back here for Sleep TV, um, going over different topics, opening up the room um, for questions, um, kind of like what we did tonight. Um, so again, everyone here is saying nice job. Um, oh, I think I coined a phrase. Carrie says, thank you, Jedi Master. Sorry, Dr. Smith, it's sticking. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone say thank you. So um, again, thank you guys um, so much for joining us. And Dr. Ken Smith, I had a wonderful time listening to you and um, I'm sure everyone did as well. We had a lot of good folks here watching on Facebook and here in Zoom as well. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. On your calendars every Tuesday, 8 p.m. I just have it on my calendar. It just pops up every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Yep, every Tuesday. And we will broadcast here through the um, Zoom. Um, And starting next week, I believe we're going to be broadcasting on both Facebook and LinkedIn. So there's multiple ways for you guys to watch. And if you can't make it live, we'll always have the broadcast recording um, on social media. Next week, I think we're going to hit on the topic of insurance a little bit more. Um, you know, Dr. Smith talked t- tonight about how that was one of the singular most important factors and, you know, in his referring physicians is making it easy for patients and, and being able to work with the system the same way that they do and not charge these big fees out of pocket and, and just, and do it in a friendly way. So we're going to talk about that next week in, in a little bit more detail, how we can help people with that and scale that up a little bit. Yeah, and like Ronnie said, Ask Me can help with that. Um, Absolutely. So if you come to Roundtable, we'll we'll have a good discussion <laughs> about Ask Me and how we can help you get in network with insurances. So anyway, look forward to seeing a lot of you out there in a few weeks. 
Yep, so I think we're good right. here. No more questions. I'm checking um, Facebook. We're good. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And we will still see you all next week again for Sleep TV next week on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you then. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.